Hi, I'm Shinobi from Bitcoin Magazine, and I'm sitting here with William Shro from Botnex Labs, uh, the designers of Spider Chain. So uh, I feel like with the whole BitVM uh, roll up, Cat VM frenzy, everybody's kind of forgotten about Spider Chains. And you know, you guys have been just kind of quietly keeping your head down and working at things. I guess, uh, you know, how is progress looking these days? No, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a lot of different uh, designs for what you call yeah, the layer twos on uh, on Bitcoin. Uh, there's been a massive amount of uh, of hype, a lot of different white papers. But when you think about it, Bitcoin is still extremely hard to build on. Um, it's still not easy, even with BitVM, uh, where you can run random com computations. It's not fully clear yet, like how a fully trustless or decentralized bridge would actually look like. And so, out of all these designs, actually, the spider chain still stands out. Uh, we don't need a soft fork today. We can actually build a design that's capable to be fully decentralized, where you can have 10,000 different nodes running. And so, I think in all of crypto and Bitcoin, you typically have these narratives overall over the few months. And so well, in the beginning, people hear about the spider chains, then it went about BitVM, and then of course you had the BRC20s, and then of course you had runes. And so all these narratives keeps following on. And uh, I think what's important is just to keep building. Um, there's a lot to be built. Um, it's not easy to actually build, to go from that white paper to actually to a working product. And so we've been heads down, we've been building. And so uh, yeah, you, uh, you suddenly gain a lot of traction. Then there's an intermediate period where you actually build and then basically you uh, um, you come out again where you actually have a product and um, I am uh, proud that we've been building a lot there is a lot going on in the background and there's a lot coming in the next few weeks and it's actually going to be really really exciting um, there's been a lot of talks on like oh we can build all of these things yeah. but we're actually doing it and so it's exciting to actually start see play out um, in the next few year few months and I think by the end of the year this this whole space will actually explode and actually finally see a Bitcoin layer 2 with massive adoption. So very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I guess just for viewers who kind of didn't really see or catch spider chains and all the roll-up frenzy, uh, you kind of want to do like a quick high-level breakdown of it. Like I, the, the way I framed it after you first announced the white paper was kind of like an open-ended federation where you have this dynamic open set that people can freely join and kind of take a segmented control or role in, in the federation. Uh, you you kind of want to like break down the mechanics of how it works at a high level real quick that's exactly a very good description the, i think the easiest description for more uh bitcoin minded people to like imagine it is a little bit like the lightning network but then like totally different but let me explain um the lightning network is the only decentralized layer too and in a very high level how it works is if you and i open a channel that's a two out of two multisig if you open another channel, that's a two out of two multisig. And so the Lightning Network is actually this decentralized network of two out of two multisigs. Mm -hmm. And so if you park that idea, but then think bigger, um, and you can have, for example, 10,000 different federation members or open federation members or full nodes, as we call it, or orchestrators, what you will do is you will generate one multisig, a big multisig, a frost multisig of 100 random members. So you randomly choose 100 participants out of the 10,000 and they will secure the first multisig. And then you do that again for the second multisig. Again, you randomly choose 100 participants out of the 10,000 and they will secure the second multisig. And then you do that again for multisig three, four, five, six. And after a while, you have this whole dis distributed network of decentralized multisigs. And that's how you actually uh, secure uh, the Bitcoin. Um, and that's how you actually decentralize the network. And this is actually a massive game changer. If you look at all the layer two designs we have today on Ethereum, they're all actually very centralized. Um, and that might be trusted, but it comes with a lot of different issues like censorship resistance, data availability, upgradability, decentralized sequencing. And so the moment you go decentralized, you actually solve all of these issues. Um, now I've talked about like that design, it's like the overlay network on Bitcoin, but then how you actually secure the EVM is by introducing a proof of stake. So before you're able to run a full node, you're able to stake Bitcoin. 
And the proof of stake is actually quite novel because that proof of stake will both secure that decentralized network of multisigs and will also secure the EVM. And that's a little bit how you have to think about the whole architecture. So the spider chain is this whole overlaying network of distributed, distributed multisigs. And then basically you have the spider chain EVM that's secured by that same, uh, that same network. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's pretty much just like the dynamic of a federation, but rather than the, the single key set holding all of the funds packed in, you just have them kind of spread around and the, the risk distributed. So if, if anybody were to you know, act maliciously or you know, potentially keys were compromised, it's only that small pot of funds that's ever actually at risk or could be stolen. Yeah, no, exactly, and that's the reason for it. Like, when you, when you think about all layer two designs, for example, like an Arbitrum or an Optimism or any other, other Ethereum layer twos, there's one big honeypot. There's one smart contract with, I don't know, $10 billion on it, and it has 15 keys. That's it, man. Anyone who has a majority of those keys can steal everything. Even today, there's not a single roll-up or layer two on Ethereum um, that actually has a better trust model than that. And so now suddenly, if you decentralize a network of multisigs, what you solve for is not only the capital efficiency, you no longer have that honeypot, you also have suddenly like uh, decentralized ownership. Um, there's no single party that can own that, that whole thing. Um, you suddenly have the permissionless. Anyone can join in that, in that network. And so you have a lot of different benefits that you actually solve by yeah, distributing that among like uh, um, a whole network. Mm -hmm. And you know, how does the design actually handle a situation where like one of these multi-sigs is under the control of a malicious actor or set of actors that, that actually does steal the funds? Yeah. That's where uh, some, some cool mathematics comes into play. Actually, statistically, once you're sufficiently big enough, that's impossible unless you have two-thirds majority of the stake. So, for example, if you have 100,000 Bitcoin staked in the whole network, you would need 200,000 Bitcoin to take over two-thirds majority. Who wants to risk that amount of Bitcoin? Um, that's actually very risky. Um, and so in reality, what happens is you have that economic security of that proof of stake that basically secures that um, no one has two-thirds majority of any multisig. Now, it can happen that a non-economic uh, majority um, basically comes together and says like, oh, this one single multisig, um, I'm going to send everyone a signature request and try to steal all the funds. But that's where the capital efficiency comes into play. Um, because you distributed all the funds in the smaller multisig size, one single multisig basically has the backing of like a hundred um, stakers that all put in their stake. And so you basically have that capital efficiency effect over the whole network. Besides that, I want to like um, nail down one more point, because this is actually an extremely important point um, that doesn't exist yet in the whole of the cryptocurrency industry, and it's called forward security. So forward security actually comes from uh, encryption. Um, in encryption, forward security is one of the most important aspects. Uh, even if you, if, you, if you lose a key at some point, you cannot encrypt or decrypt like older messages. And the same thing happens here. Even if two-thirds majority of the stake is compromised, they will be able to steal exactly zero Bitcoin. Um, at that moment in time, they'll just have to wait. They have two-thirds majority, they're malicious, and they cannot do anything. That's an extremely important security aspect that is, I think, very under, underappreciated, actually, and doesn't exist yet. We were the first ones to introduce that into the, the cryptocurrency world. Okay, and, and that's because, um, if I remember correctly, that once a malicious majority has actually you know, entered the, the staking set, they're, they have to wait until funds are actually deposited into the system in a key set that they hold the majority of. So just, just by virtue of attaining the majority of the stake, it doesn't give them access to anything previously deposited because they, they were not the majority when those multi-sinks were established and funds were deposited. Exactly. 
and this is actually in an insane strong security part. Um, when you think about uh, how the roadmaps of a lot of different rollups look like is at some point for upgradability, you'll have to either introduce a time delay or a consensus. But even with a time delay, let's say you have a two week time delay or a 30 day time delay, after those 30 days, an attacker still knows exactly that they'll be able to steal the funds. Uh, with forward security, that's a big unknown. Yeah. Someone can stake two thirds majority, really, really risk all their all their actual Bitcoin, and have no guarantee when they will have access to yeah any of the Bitcoin, mm -hmm. even though only like a small portion. Yeah. And um, you know, mo all proof of stake designs have some kind of slashing mechanism. Um, do you, you want to break down like how slashing uh, malicious stakers works for spider chains? Absolutely. There is actually a few. Um, so the slashing logic will, in, in the initial phases, sit on the EVM. So you can take that into the second layer. Basically, um, you'll stake the actual Bitcoin in the spider chain. But on the EVM, you'll have that um, staking smart contract where the, the copy of that Bitcoin sits in. And so you can basically put there the slashing rules in there. And so there's a bunch of different slashing rules. Like if you are not live, um, like if you don't respond, if you don't do a bag out, if you sign a malicious transaction, um, if you miss your blocks. And so for each of these malicious actions, there's either a small penalty or there's like a full, full, full slashing. Um, and so that's how you basically yeah, prove that and get consensus on the slashing. For example, it's very easy. If you try to steal Bitcoin from a multisig that is malicious and there's no burning on the second layer, and so you try to steal it, everyone sees that signal signature request, you can submit that to that slashing smart contract um, and then you can basically everyone um, agrees on it that this person or this staker has to get slashed mm -hmm. because you have consensus on it. And I guess, dude, do you want to talk about why proof of stake actually is a functional model when built on top of a proof of work system versus just existing as a base consensus protocol itself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is an interesting one because I used to be a proof of work maximalist, as I call it. Um, but it's actually very interesting. Once you go deeper into proof of stake and why it's insecure on the base layer, you actually start noticing that all of those issues are are solved once you build them on top of a proof of work. And let me break them down for you. For example, the, probably the biggest argument for me was always the economic argument. In a proof of stake, it's very centralizing over time. You basically start with 100% of the assets, and the stakers have maybe like a little bit, like 20% of it, but they get more and more staking rewards. So over time, the stakers get a bigger and bigger percentage of the whole stake. So it's a very centralizing um, trend, and you basically call, call that a, a closed system. Proof of work is totally opposite. That's a leaking system. Um, actual Bitcoin will leak inside, um, to like the outside world with like electricity. Um, and so that's a decentralizing trend over time. So that's the economic argument. Um, from a security perspective, proof of stake is very, yeah, very insecure and has a lot of different attack models with the randomization. Basically, how it works is you have all the different stakers and you will randomly choose a certain staker and say like, okay, you can build the next block. But how do you actually get a random number? And that's actually way more gameable than you would think. And so coming up with a random number is extremely hard. And guess what we are doing in Bitcoin? For all tens of minutes, for all 10 minutes, we spend a huge amount of energy to actually come up with a completely random number. And so you can use Bitcoin's block hash to basically solve uh, for that randomization number. Um, it's a synchronizing, it's a timer, it's a clock, um, it provides randomization. And then a third argument um, is finality and is what you call the long range attack. One of the issues with the proof of stake is um, what if you have a chain split? How do you get finality, right? A proof of work that's very, very uniquely and very cleanly solved by actually the, um, yeah, the hash rate, like you follow the longest chain and eventually probabilistically you will have a chain that it can no longer be changed. You don't have that on proof of stake. And so that introduces a lot of different attacks like the long range 
attack. Um, and so you have to create this new algorithm to create finality. Um, and for in, in Ethereum, for example, that is called the Gasper al algorithm. Um, but the interesting thing is, once you're actually connected to a proof of work, you can inherit that finality from Bitcoin by basically timestamping and checking in with the Merkle roots of your second layer, you basically inherit the finality of uh, Bitcoin itself. And so basically a lot of the biggest issues of a proof of stake are solved by building an online proof of work. And that's actually a very unique insight that I, uh, that I noticed. Um, before we started out, I don't think there was anyone who even considered that we we're building a new consensus layer on top of another consensus layer. It was kind of weird in essence. Why, why do you need additional consensus? Uh, but basically you, you can see that there's different trade-offs between a proof of stake or a proof of work. Mm -hmm. All right, and I guess, uh, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot with a hard estimate here, but you know, how long do you think it'll be before we actually see something going live that people can start using? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, so we're actually uh, made a lot of different progress over the last few months. Uh, we've implemented like uh, the bigger Frost Multisigs. Uh, we've built uh, the initial uh, federation. We will start with a, a federated sidechain and basically build out from there. Um, that federated sidechain will probably go live in the next uh, two months. Okay. Uh, all right. That is good news. I guess we're going to have a, a new system to play with. Absolutely, very excited. Uh, yeah, we've been on testnet since November. Um, and it's been absolutely incredible. I think we have now a million transactions. We have more than 200,000 unique different wallets connected. We have 10,000 different tokens being launched. Yeah. And so uh, the community is very, very much looking forward to actually uh, going to main. And I think there's a, there's a do dozen dApps already deployed, um, so it's been been, uh, and it's been very, very successful. Awesome. Well, great to hear. And uh, thanks for sitting down with me for your chat, Wilhelm. Absolutely. Hope everybody enjoyed. Absolutely.